should you bite the bullet, indulge your inner boy racer, and drive off into the sunset in a GR Yaris. Just associating the word Yaris with anything even vaguely desirable does feel a little odd, gotta say. And will it be a decent investment if you do this? There's that to consider. Details next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. A website for that, obviously, unless, of course, you enjoy holding your ankles and humming Moon River in a car dealership. Some people do like that and I still don't understand why. Now, oxymoron from hell, desirable Yaris. My cup runneth over currently with questions such as this. Hi John and auto expert team. I'm interested in the Toyota GR Yaris track pack. Your opinion please. Goodbye, investment potential, limited market I suspect. But if you could, would, love, am able to do a review, wow. I am genuinely interested in this vehicle. Toyota GR Yaris track pack. Thank you and love the YouTube antics. Foolish, outrageous and amusing behaviour. Well done. Thanks, Marcus. It's great to see you've got the good sense to approach your favourite outrageous YouTube fool, the antics of whom will doubtless help you the better to evaluate the merits of investing $45,000 on a Yaris. Good plan. Approved. Look, this is a pure driver's car. Big tick. The GR is essentially not really a Yaris at all, at least not as we have been inculcated to expect one, right? This is a full on WRC homologation special. <laughs> it's really a completely different body, you know, three doors plus it's lower and wider and lighter. It's got 260 more spot welds and something like 15 meters of more adhesive used in the construction and a full on carbon fiber roof, who doesn't like that? All of these things, of course, make this vehicle incredibly stiff in comparison to a base model Yaris. Massive grille at the front, twin exhaust at the back, world's most powerful turbo petrol three-cylinder engine. So there's that. 1.6 litres too, so they're pretty big cylinders. Out there. I like three cylinders too. They're literally half of a straight six. And because they've cut that crankshaft in half, there's kind of an out-of-balance rotating couple inherent to the design that tends to make an inline three rock longitudinally, right? So... They're typically categorized as raucous because of this longitudinal rocking, and a lot of cars need to try really, really hard to mask that, but not this one, pretty clearly, given the intent. 200 kilowatts and 360 newton meters too, and the turbo makes it pretty punchy above about 3,000 RPM, that's five and a bit seconds to 100 kind of thing. So properly quick in a straight line, very responsive to drive, all of that stuff, and proper all-wheel drive too. Not this on-demand rubbish, okay? The default setting is 60-40 torque split front to rear, but if you select sport, you actually get 70% of the drive at the rear, or you can opt for 50-50 if you select track mode as well. So it's pretty versatile. You can dial in the balance to suit your own frame of mind and the prevailing conditions. There's a full independent suspension at the rear as well and huge brakes, 18 inch alloys running Pilot Sport 4S Michelin tires. What I'm saying essentially is proper driver's car. I mean, you get this hardware and do even a half decent job tuning it, it's gonna be fairly special, right? And for a change, this is a proper driver's car from Toyota and that doesn't happen very often. Once every couple of decades maximum, if you look at recent history. Six speed manual, it's got rev matching, but you can turn that off if you wanna go old school and do the heel and toe thing. And you can turn off the ESC if you wanna recalibrate your own slide rule, which in a car like this, you would want to do that from time to time. And even an old-fashioned pull-up handbrake down there, yes. Which, if activated, I'm told, with the car in motion, decouples the all-wheel drive system. Goodness me, you know, why would anyone want to do that? Said everyone's grandmother driving a Yaris. 
It would be a travesty, I think you'd agree, having an electronic handbrake on a car such as this. So well done there. It's even got radar cruise control if you want to do the daily driving thing, which is pretty rare in a manual. But as for hmm, investment potential, we've got to talk about that. It seems to me that the past is a really good informant on the future, as long as you're prepared to strap it down into a chair and kind of interrogate it. And I'd suggest what a difference 28 years makes, right? Because back in 1992, and I'm tipping some people buying that Yaris GR will not have been alive then. But back in 1992, Toyota released the Celica GT4, which had that same sort of WRC intent, right? Here in Australia, they even had a rally with an E on the end of it, rally version of that Celica. It had a two-litre four-cylinder engine, had all-wheel drive, 153 kilowatts, 275 newton metres. It weighed about 1,500 kilos, give or take, and that gave it 106 kilowatts per tonne worth of power to weight, which was quite impressive back then. I'd have to say there was a lot of hype about that car. I remember when they released it and driving it, it kind of felt big and heavy and it went okay, but it wasn't a real ball tear, you know what I mean? Anyway, they were 50,000 bucks. That's not like 50 grand today, which is like chump change in a sense when you devalue the dollar for 28 years, right? That's not like spending 50 grand today at all. This was a proper amount of money back then. It was a very expensive device. And if memory serves, there was a queue over the horizon for people who lusted after this in the manner that people are lusting after the Yaris GR today, right? And on paper, they're kind of the same, they've got the same intent, designed by the same kinds of dudes, and the only difference is, you know, 28 years, and also one cylinder, and let's not forget about 50 more kilowatts, and a shitload more torque as well, frankly, and the Yaris GR is lighter, and it's got the best part of 50% more power to weight ratio, and it's only 45 grand, and that's in today's dollars. So it's got to be like half the price when you consider what the spending power of 50 grand was then versus the spending power of 45 grand today. So with that all in mind, this is the scene, okay? This is the historical precedent and this is today's car. And what we've got to do is investment 101. So with the past strapped to the chair, informing on the future, all right? This is the GT4 as a precedent, you know, as a predictor of what might happen with your GR. And we don't know how much the track pack is gonna add when Toyota Australia releases the rally with an E version of the Yaris GR, but let's just say it's 50 grand, kind of like the Celica was back then, at least in number terms, if not in spending power terms, all right? If you look at the data from Red Book for the uh, GT4 and predict that this is kind of how the Yaris GR is gonna go over that time, you're gonna spend 50 grand, okay? That's what you did if you bought a GT4 back then. And now it's worth eight and a half grand, average price predicted by Red Book as a private sale, okay? So you've turned 50 grand into eight and a half in 28 years. In investment terms, not that good. You've lost $41,500, and this is the opposite of what you're trying to achieve when you invest money in anything. So in addition to that, even if you haven't used that GT4 as your daily driver and you don't intend to use your Yaris GR today as your daily driver, you just want to keep it registered and drive it every Sunday or something, it's still going to cost you at least a couple of grand a year just to register it and insure it and service it, right? It's probably going to cost more than that. Speedy cars are often quite expensive to insure, aren't they? So, you know, even if it just costs you two grand a year or your GT4 costs you two grand a year, that's another 56,000 bucks down the tubes. So let's say you've got the 50 grand burning a hole in your wallet right now. You've managed to squirrel it away from your 25 ex-wives and now it's time to invest. I might invest in a Yaris GR. Let's compare the historical precedent of just 
picking one of the big banks and buying shares in them. And I did this at random, literally dart, podger into the wall, and it landed on the National Shitsville Bank, one of the big four, right? Now, I hate banks, except in the context of owning a bit of them. They do tend to be a little bit lovable if you own a little one, little tiny chunk of it, not as much as a super fund or Warren Buffett or something, but if you own just a little bit of a bank, it does tend to recalibrate what you think about banks because if you dumped your 50 grand back then in 1992 into the National Shitsville Bank here, you would have walked away with 7,132 shares at just over seven bucks a pop, thanks very much, and today they would be worth, that's right, 154 big ones. And you would thus be... 104,000 bucks in front on your initial investment. Now, that might mean that you've only just kept pace in terms of the spending power. I don't know. I couldn't be asked looking at the consumer price index for 28 years and figuring that out. But any way you look at it, it's kind of better than being 41,500 bucks behind on an asset that's cost you 2,000 bucks just to keep registered and insured in the friggin' garage, right? Now, in addition to that, though, happily enough, you did earn a dividend on each one of these shares, and I went back, there's 56 dividends, right, there's two a year, an interim dividend and an end-of-year dividend, and if you add all of them up from 1993 to 2020 inclusive, you end up with $40.62 per share worth of dividends, which is, wait for it, 290000 bucks. thanks very much. Like, I do like that. 290,000 bucks, the dividend is more than the capital growth of the shares, right? Like, that's huge. If you add them up, the 154 grand that your shares are worth today, and just the dividends you got, and I'm being so conservative here because I couldn't be asked to do the mathematics on reinvesting the dividends every year, so I just sort of put them aside metaphorically into a sort of virtual bank account. It'd be even more than this in total if you reinvested the dividends, because obviously you'd have more shares appreciating more and they'd be earning more dividends as well as a consequence incrementally over time. But who's got time to do all of that? Just saying, 444,000 bucks minus being worst investment of all time in the red over here on the car. And the conclusion is, of course, that Cars are a dud investment. You have to be like luckier than lightning striking your ex-wife or something to make a win on a car. And even then, it's not a big win. You know, if you could buy a car 28 years ago and it turned into 440,000 bucks, there would be headlines all over the shop. But if you got your 50 grand today and instead of dumping it on a Yaris, right, however exciting, if you just dumped it into some blue chip thing like a bank, okay, it's going to be worth something like this 30 years down the track. So it depends. You can have the love or you can have the money, but I don't see those two things coexisting. And incidentally, you do have to pay some tax on the dividend at $40.62. Um, National Australia Bank shares are generally fully franked in the dividends, right? So the company tax is paid on them and they've had like seven shares where the dividends weren't paid and one of those years was like, um, seven years, sorry, where the dividends weren't paid and one was like 79% franked, three more dividends were 80% franked and another three dividends were 90% franked. So the majority of the tax has already been paid on the dividend for the majority of Shitsville taxpayers. So you don't even cop much of a bill for the tax on the dividends here. Investments aren't fun. They make you money. Cars are fun. You always lose money. And I don't see us having a grand unified theory. If this is quantum mechanics and this is relativity, I just don't see these two aspects of the monetary equation being unified anytime soon, sadly. So the GR is essentially Toyota's take on Hyundai's N, three-pronged suppositories AMG, Bavarian money wasters M, and four ringed wanking tractors RS. That'll get back. It doesn't intrinsically mean anything, okay, GR. It's just, it's, everything's got to have a name, right? Only 25,000 of these vehicles will be made worldwide, and in the DUK, or 
disunited kingdom, they do a track pack with uprated suspension and front and rear torsen style limited slip differentials plus forged 18 inch alloys, presumably they're just a little bit lighter, but there's no powertrain upgrades with the track pack. The track pack, however, is a box that you would want to tick if you lust after a car of this nature, just for the diffs alone. <laughs> it's three and a half thousand pounds sterling for the track pack, which is about six and a half thousand Schittsvillian micro pesos and falling. Here in Australia, Toyota has decided to go all mystical on this track pack thing and offer a rally, with an E at the end, rally edition in 2021. It's a GR with the Disunited Kingdom's track pack, basically. This is like one last prick tease in the model range, sort of delayed gratification thing after selling the first batch of these vehicles kind of cheap. So, should you buy one? Well, the back seat is crap, frankly, and there's no headroom back there. I don't think there's a spare tyre. I'd have to check on that, though, and research. You know, I'm not predisposed to do that in a medium such as YouTube, having been a journalist where you had to check facts. I mean, bugger that. Uh, the boot space has taken a real hit, too. Okay, so there's that. If you want to go away for the weekend, it's like a little cut lunch only. Or I guess you can fold the seats down. I'd have to check that as well. There's a lot of deficiencies in my research when you drill down. And, well, you don't have to drill that far. Just scratch the veneer. Anyway, there's fake exhaust noise being pumped through the stereo too, and I do hate that. And this is because Toyota can't exactly meet the emissions regulations and also make the exhaust rock and roll at the same time, at least in the manner that you and I might prefer. And there's no bimodal exhaust option either, disappointingly. Performance is kind of line ball with a WRX STI, but this vehicle is more compact and the novelty factor is off the friggin' chart, right? So STI, we've seen them a lot. This car, not so much. You could probably even drive this vehicle every day, right? Performance cars aren't that great at that. But if you're suitably infatuated, you can probably tolerate the daily driving shortcomings, right? Because you love cars like this. However, the reality of cars like this is that most people who buy them, they simply lack the skill to drive them at or near their limit, which is kind of how their maker intended. And even if you do have that spooky software programmed in, upstairs. Doing that on a public road is kind of irresponsible and almost certainly illegal and, you know, your passengers will probably hate it unless they're car nuts just like you and they've got to trust you. So most cars of this nature, therefore, spend the majority of their lives in either incompetence mode or self-restraint mode, depending on the driver, or they're stuck in traffic on the way to and from work, like most of us every day. No word yet on Toyota Schittsville's position on the factory warranty either, should you take your track pack equipped GR to an actual track and blow out the cobwebs, which you probably do want to do from time to time. Some manufacturers take quite a dim view on behaviour such as that, like what were you thinking at warranty time? It's perverse, but hey, anything to get out of a warranty claim, right? I'm not saying Toyota will do this. I'm saying if you buy this car, you would want to clarify that. And not just verbally, I would want to see an assurance in writing about the warranty validation for use such as that. The bottom line, buying a car like this is absolutely a love thing. And love is blind, you know, it doesn't have to add up. And you don't have to rationalise love at all, right? It just happens to you. Personally, I'd love to carve up some rich wanker in an A45 AMG three-pronged suppository special in my Yaris, in the wet, preferably on the outside if the day was going just Goldilocks. That would be just one of those enduring special moments in a car like this. Am I right? So, you should buy this car if you love it. If it moves you, you know, down there. Don't justify it to yourself as an investment. Doing that, that kind of thing is about as real as the Easter friggin' bunny.